Today on Off the Clock, we are going to be talking about job descriptions. How to have job descriptions that you can use for the benefit of your organization. What to include, what not to include, and everything else you should be thinking about. Welcome to Off the Clock, the webcast of employment attorneys at Miller Johnson, where we discuss what is happening in the HR world and provide practical insight and advice. I am excited. How are you? I know. I know. <laughs> you have a special kind of energy for job descriptions, I, and I think that's awesome. You know why? <laughs> I don't I know why. Don't know why. I don't know why. In fact, I don't. <laughs> yeah, please tell me why. Here is why. It's on everyone's to-do list, right? It is. It's like eating our But there's our a vegetables. reason for that, because nobody wants to do it. <laughs> So yes. it's carried over from 22 to 23 yeah. to 24. That's right. That's right. Okay. I know. But it's like eating our Please vegetables. Help us. It's Please one help of us. those things. Yes. And I think people will look more forward to it now because I think someone says update the job descriptions. Mm -hmm. And the HR department looks at it and like, well, what, what does that mean exactly? What do I do? How can I actually make this thing better? better to help sure. le how can where we do leverage I even, these to advantage where do I even start the really how where can do I, I add value yeah. right and once you realize the ways you can do that it gets kind of fun okay uh, you're selling me <laughs> I gotcha it's I fun gotcha. Yeah. it's fun okay. it's each one is a challenge so let's let's talk about that for a minute why why is it important to have job descriptions at all and in particular good job descriptions why do you, what, why, why does it matter from a legal standpoint? Yeah, I was going to say there's certainly an employee relations angle on this that we could talk about a long time if we wanted to, but we're a couple of lawyers, so. <laughs> let's, the, let's, let's stay in our lane. Let's, yeah. <laughs> the things that I think about first, there's really two things, the Fair Labor Standards Act and then medical issues in the workplace, ADA yeah. primarily, but also FMLA and some others. And the pregnant so workers. So the, those are the times when I most I'm most likely to ask a client for the job description, right? Yeah. With FLSA specifically exemption questions, right? And uh, when someone can't do one thing or another, we right. need to figure out what to do about that. I agree with that. Those are the right? two biggest. Those are the times when we say we need a job description. Yeah. We need to see your job description. Yep. yep. Okay. So yep. let's take the first one first, the the exemption, right? Yep. When it, a business has somebody who's been classified as exempt, Yep. Right? What's really important about that job description to you? Well, it's important to remember under the Fair Labor Standards Act that everyone is presumed non-exempt. Right. Unless their job duties are exempt yeah. job duties. So right. when I say it like that, I think you know the answer and everyone listening knows the answer, right? Right. If we have classified a certain position as exempt... The job description listing the job duties should list exempt duties, and they yeah. we should list That's them. That's a really good starting place. First. Isn't it? <laughs> yes, and it, at the top, right? I know it sounds obvious, but I have reviewed a lot of job descriptions in my Fair Labor Standards Act work. That's one of the things I do. I either review a position to help a client determine what classification the job should be, or in conjunction or and in conjunction with that, uh, we will conclude that this is a properly exempt position, but the job description does not Reflect make it that. look like that. And the first thing the Department of Labor is going to ask or plaintiff's lawyer is going to ask yeah. is show me the job description. Right. Yeah. Right? Yes. So yeah. so what exactly to place in the job description depends on the exemption you're relying on, of course, right? If you're relying on the outside sales exemption, <laughs> the first bullet or two should be making sales outside of the office, right? Go right. I like going right to the exemption language itself, mm -hmm. right? If we're using That's the administrative right. exemption, which is, of course, everyone's favorite, uh, you can use phrases like exercise discretion, right? Exercise independent Good discretion mm -hmm. over. And then you don't have to say matters of significance because that no one understands what that, your employee won't understand what that is. But you can say, exercises independent discretion over budgets. Exercises independent discretion over selecting vendors with relationships over 100,000. Do you yeah. see what I mean? So you're exercising independent judgment over right. 
and then the matter of significance will be something much more specific. So whatever Fill in the blank and say what it is. Yep, yep. Exactly. So whatever exemption you're relying on, please make sure that's reflected in the job description. And <laughs> make sure it looks like it is, in fact, the primary duty. So make sure the job description reflects that. If you've got 25 duties, don't make the exempt duties 23, 24, and 25. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? The, every, most people have both exempt and non-exempt duties, right? Like I used to make, before we got the Keurig thing, if I was first in, I would make the coffee, right? right. But I'm still exempt. That wasn't my primary duty. So making the coffee shouldn't be number one, <laughs> if that makes sense. It can still be there, mm -hmm. but not number one. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that, that is that. A, an error in job descriptions. Uh, I see quite a, a common bit. one and it a can have meaning, one. right? And it's, it's true that a job title and even a job description isn't necessarily determinative Correct. as to whether a position is exempt or not. Mm -hmm. However, you and I have both seen job descriptions that have dug employers <laughs> a big hole, right. right? Where it doesn't list any exempt. Where it doesn't, yes. And so, <laughs> and so they're starting off, right, having to climb out of a giant hole to right. try to demonstrate that the position right. is really exempt. As one person said once, it's like walking into the meeting with the DOL with your foot in a bucket filled with cement. <laughs> Why? Yes. Why would you do that to yourself and your organization? Yes. So if, if reviewing job descriptions is on your to-do list, that's one thing you can look for. And, right? and, and can really I say value. too, yeah, if, if reviewing job descriptions is on your to-do list, then maybe as a starting place, you start with exempt positions. Yes. Because that task, I would argue, is particularly important for exempt positions. Yes. So, so for those listeners who have had this on your to-do list for a long time and you're yep. not quite sure where to start, Yep, there you go. There you go. Start with your exempt position, particularly those that are close to the minimum salary amount, which as we know is going up. Uh, Just went up and it's went going up. up again. It's going up again and yeah. will go up once every three years. Yeah. So, so when we're talking about exemption issues, I always suggest starting at the ones closest to the economic border fine, right? Because yeah. that's probably where your most risk is. Right. Yep. Oh, that's uh, a great, great and going from too. there and going right. from the there. CEO's probably less risk. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't, I'm not sure I've ever seen a CEO job description. Maybe as part of a it's CEO usually part employment of contract. agreement. <laughs> yes, exactly. But not, but not in the pile of job descriptions. Well, actually, review. you know when else job descriptions are written? It's not necessarily on the to-do list to update, but we see them being written when there's an open position. Yeah. Sometimes for the for the position posting, right? It'll be like a job description yeah. that's written and then attached to the LinkedIn or yeah. or whatever it is. So sometimes there are, actually, yeah. I really, really like using job postings as a regular opportunity to keep job positions up to date and up uh, to speed. Yes. The reason I like that is um, for our folks who are listening, who are, are HR mm -hmm. in the HR office, right? Um, for any of them who have had to update job descriptions, they know doing a good job with a job description absolutely requires collaboration and real input from the leader, from yes. the from the direct leader, mm -hmm. right? To tell you what's critical about this job. What is this, what does the person in, in this position need to be able to do, to do, need to be able to do well, to be successful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes it's hard to put job descriptions at the top of that person's list too <laughs> and make it a priority, really. Sure. Operational folks have lots to do. Yep. So when we're in a position in which a leader needs to fill a role, that's just a great opening. Yeah. Right. That's to have point. that connection and to be able to say, let's sit down together and let's talk yep. about what this job is and what you're really looking for. And as part of that process, mm -hmm. let's make sure that the job position is up to date. And then that can be shared with the recruiter, for instance, for Correct. folks that are working with outside recruiters. Yes. 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 I love so that. that's a great way, again, to keep them up to date. Um, okay, so let's talk about the second legal reason why job descriptions yeah. are so important. 
Um, and that is for what is now kind of a, an alphabet soup of, a, <laughs> of a, acronyms of federal laws and state laws that involve medical issues in the workplace. The ADA, yeah. certainly, the FMLA, now the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. All of those laws talk about um, an employee's ability to perform what's called essential job functions. Yeah. And right? this one requires a bit more discussion. Right? This one requires yeah. a lot of discussion. Yeah. This, yes. is, this is fascinating to me, So how we determine it and when, what we can include. Exactly. When mm -hmm. we're in a situation in which we are... Um, we have an employee with a medical concern, and we need to know what the essential functions of a job are. Mm -hmm. One starting place is to look at the job description. Yep. And to see what it has to say, to see sure. what it has to tell us, yeah. right? And, and a well-done job description. Can be very helpful. It can win a case. Right, like it can win, yep. it can win the case, right? It uh, can. I've, I'm not sure I've ever seen that be the case, but <laughs> I suppose it's As possible. well as excellent lawyering. <laughs> I'm not fair. sure I've ever seen Yes. To be fair. That's pretty tough because, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell you about one in a minute. Okay. Go ahead. So let's just use this as a starting place. I prefer, and you can tell me what you think of this, okay? Uh -huh. Recognizing that the legal term that's used under the ADA and the FMLA and the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, the legal term that's used is, quote, essential job functions. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Okay. In reality, what a particular employee's essential job functions are is an incredibly individualized assessment. Right. Okay. For that reason, I, I prefer job descriptions not use the term essential job functions. Gosh, I see that all the time, Sarah. I don't like it because <laughs> you're making a legal conclusion yeah. and potentially backing the organization into a corner. Right. What you're saying is, I've looked at this job, I and in particular, I've looked at this person's job duties, and I've determined as a matter of law <laughs> These are this person's essential job functions. And I don't think there's an HR person in this country that has the time and the bandwidth and the energy to possibly do that for all the employees in their organization. I, I, that's ridiculous, right? It's just ridiculous. No one right? does it on an individual right? basis. Right? So instead, what I what I prefer to see are job descriptions that talk about the requirements of the role in a broader way that leave us room then to elaborate, to extrapolate mm -hmm. for a particular employee when we need to do that and really identify as a matter of law what that person's essential job functions are. So maybe the heading should say something like typical job duties. Sure. Job requirements. Typical a day job in requirements. Right. A day in the life. I've seen job descriptions that are more Your clever, role like, in serving our customers yeah. includes. Yeah. I've seen that. I think that's fun, right? Yes. Uh, it's something right, that is always focusing exactly. on the mission, the mission. Exactly. Right? But please yeah. avoid using the legal term essential job functions. Okay. And that is, by the way, just, <laughs> I mean, if you use... Uh, AI to write a job description or go to Google or any of these like forms, they will all say essential, essential job, job functions. So be wary. Be wary of the advice you're getting from Google. From Google. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Or AI. Yeah. Okay, okay. So now let's talk about which types of activities to actually put under that heading, whatever. Whatever you call let's it. Let's just call it job duties okay. for the sake of this conversation. What are we going to include there? And you and I had a kind of a spirited conversation before we started recording about, about what to include and what not to include. What to include and what not to include. Well, should we, let's divide into two buckets. Okay. Because that's how I usually see it playing out. Let's start with the physical requirements, right? Most job descriptions want to list the physical requirements of the job <laughs> in some fashion. They all include that section. Yes. yes. Lifting weight. <laughs> Twisting, pulling, bending, bending, standing, jumping jacks, somersaults, walking, <laughs> <laughs> uneven bars, <laughs> the vault. <laughs> you can tell 7.0 or higher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, I, my experience with those is the physical requirements are rarely accurate. <laughs> At least those that list with specificity yeah. the amount, not only the activity, but some amount of weight or repetition or something like that. Right. Right. I, I, a hundred percent agree with you. And they usually, it's usually more than is really required. Right. Cause they don't want to do less. Right. Because then they could get into trouble. Right. If someone says I can lift 40, but not 30. Right. You don't want to, you or the other way around, I can lift 30, but not 40. You don't want to list 30. And then all of a sudden there's a 40 pound box that has to be lifted. Correct. You've just, um, done yourself. And definitely. I've seen a lot of job descriptions that say things like continuous lifting. That like awful all day. <laughs> I think, my God, no yeah. human being can lift things ten, eight to ten hours straight. How is that even <laughs> physically possible, right? <clears throat> so, with regard to the physical requirements, mm-hmm. I prefer generally listing what physical requirement might be in place. So maybe mm-hmm. just lifting. Okay. Okay. And then I don't like putting a certain weight mm-hmm. or repetition. Mm-hmm. And I know you like this too. <laughs> I instead like tying it to what they actually have to do. Right. I, I like that too. What yeah. are they lifting? Product? Patience? Right. Lifting reams of paper. Right. Must be able, for instance, must be able to lift reams of paper. Or from for floor us, to must third be able level to lift shelf. a pen. <laughs> Instead of must be able to raise arms over, ha- right? Yes. Like what do they actually Correct. have to do? Must be able to lift patients of all sizes from the floor to their beds. Correct. Right? Things like that, right? Instead of the twisting, the pulling, the weight, the, right. So, and for a production associate position, which is a great example, the thing that they lift is probably parts or products, mm-hmm. the size of which can vary greatly depending mm-hmm. on where this person is in the production line, mm-hmm. right? So it could say simply must be able to regularly lift mm-hmm. parts or and or products, mm-hmm. which needed. vary. Needed for their place needed on the production for the, line. Exactly. Right, something and like then, that. And then when applied to a particular employee, it's not, then it leaves us the ability to look at their exact assignment and say, oh, here's the product or the part that you actually have to lift. You were assigned. It's a pen or (laughs) it's 20 reams of paper, right? (laughs) Exactly. Right. We are definitely both on the same page with that. We see those physical requirements uh, that go overboard or pile on. And so some people think that's safer to do that, but the problem is you lose credibility. I was just going to say that. You, you lose really credibility. Do. You um, really do. I've been at many depths in which an HR person has been questioned about the physical requirements <laughs> on a job description, and it's very yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. So, so uh, some people might still do that if it makes if it's actually true mm-hmm. for certain positions. They want to make sure applicants and employees have a heads up, right? Yeah. However, if you can describe it in terms of the actual job duty, what they're actually doing, instead of the amount of pounds or trying to describe the actual physical movement, you may be better off. Yes, that's another way you can add value to your job descriptions as you're reviewing them this year. Love it. Awesome. All right. Now, my favorite thing to talk about <laughs> are the non-task um, specific parts of the job description. So what do I mean by that? Like task specific would be answering the phones, right? Yeah. Installing computers for new employees, right? Analyzing sales data and producing reports by the first of the month. Those are very task specific. Mm-hmm. But what you and I get excited about, and those should all be in the job description for sure. Uh, but what we get excited about are the non-task right. uh, things. Like, should we go through a few examples? Yeah, a few examples We've of got some good ones of things that um, HR folks might not think of. Yeah, but we've seen be helpful. Yep. To 
to employers, to HR professionals when they're managing employee issues and in particular um, sorting out essential job functions and trying to articulate mm -hmm. to employees why their job requires them to do something, right? Mm -hmm. So that the first probably, the first one that comes to mind is regular and predictable yeah. attendance. That's when we add, when people have us look over job descriptions. Every job description. We add that almost up. Regular and predictable ascend, uh, regular and predictable attendance is an essential job function. And I know that we should not have to say that. You should not have to say showing up is a requirement of this job. Yeah. But I promise you, it will be helpful at some point to say that out loud. Yes. And, and the reason will be, not because someone doesn't know that in the abstract, right. like they right. grew up under a rock or something, but because something's going on in their lives, right? A medical condition or a family member's medical condition or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And they say, I may have to come in late and I won't be able to tell you, right? Ahead of time. Right. <laughs> Which right. days, or you know, things like that, or I may, I can, and it can come. I'm up. going to have now. Obviously, attendance. we're talking. We're assuming you're outside of the FMLA, in which they have a right to take in or all, all, right. all of that. But in the context of the ADA, for example, it matters. Mm -hmm. It matters that regular and predictable attendance is an essential function of of a yeah. job. Yep, yeah. that's where it comes into play. So not people that yeah. you know would question that, Correct. generally speaking, but when there's a medical issue happening. Um, another one that um, I've been spending a lot of time writing and helping um, employers articulate is tied to a requirement to work in person. Oh gosh, yes, that's a hot topic, right? Yes. Now. Okay, so yeah, any HR folks who are reviewing and updating job descriptions now, mm -hmm. if this is also a position that is expected to be working in person mm -hmm. that needs to be articulated in some way in the job description. And I don't mean just saying in-person work. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen it like in the top, the classification where it says exempt or non-exempt. Yeah. It'll say in-person or remote and one of the boxes will yeah. be checked. That's not what you're talking no, about. No, that's right. not what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is really peeling back the layers and thinking about why in-person work is a requirement for the job, uh -huh. such as this is a leadership role and you directly mentor, supervise other employees. And to do that effectively, we believe it's critical for you to be engaging with those individuals directly on a day-to-day -day basis, uh -huh. right? Yep. Or... Um, regular face-to-face uh, -face collaboration mm -hmm. is required with coworkers is a requirement of this position. Yeah, I agree. Think hard. Those are, those are some ideas, about right? About whether in person, if, if your organization is requiring in-person attendance, really include that on the job description. Yep. Don't leave that out. What yes. about, um, here's one of my favorites. Okay. <laughs> we were kind of brainstorming lists of favorites demonstrates company, and I have core values, but different companies might have different names. So there's usually three, four, five right. values, right? Core values, that type. Of, they include things like integrity. Yeah, right. Uh, best effort, treating others with respect. Customers always come for it, right? Like those kinds of core values. I love putting something like that in mm -hmm. a job description. It's a great one, yeah. Right, because you can't think of everything. And we talked about this in terms of <laughs> the workplace conduct rules too, right? You can't think of everything. You just can't. Right. Right. But we do expect part of your job is, oh, hopefully this is true, part of your job every day is to reflect our company's core values in everything you do. Yep. Right. And if, if something's going on in your life that means you can't do that, that's going to be a problem, period. Right. Whether you can still produce the budget report or not. Yeah. Right. If you're going to do it, but you're going to be a jerk while you're doing it, right? That's not going to work for us. Another one is, if applicable, ability to work irregular hours, weekends, mm. overtime. Yeah, that's a good one. Right. Yeah, is, is a requirement of the position, especially the overtime one, mm -hmm. because yeah. medical issues can some. That's where medical issues can come up. Right. I can't work 
over time. You say, well, it's an essential function. It right? is an essential function that of you this do. position to be able to work over time. Exactly. Yeah. So that's helpful. I really like that. We came up with a few others, such as ability to accept and apply feedback. I love that one. Right? Yeah. Yes. Critical thinking. Yep. Acting independently, right? Doing your job independently. So when we get into those kinds of elements of a job description, and I'm thinking, how do you think of those things? How does one know <laughs> what to include? I was thinking, these are the reasons people actually get fired. These are the reasons, even if they don't get fired, they don't succeed. Yeah. Right? So maybe talking with your supervisors, and that's the way you approach the conversation is why do some people not succeed in this role? In this and why role? do some succeed? What did yeah. they have? What or, are the differences? In addition to the technical skills, mm -hmm. right? And you're going to include all those already. Well, this person makes mistakes in their monthly accounting reports, and this person doesn't. Okay. So the job description should be error-free, right? Or minimal or, errors. Right. right. What, whatever it is. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. So definitely the task yeah. level, but also the non-task specific mm -hmm. reasons people succeed or not. I think that's a great way to open the conversation and really get at the heart of can what's we, important. Can we just add one more thing too? When you're talking about the task, mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid to use appropriate adjectives like oh, I love excellent. That. Oh, you just or hit on the case you I just was thinking used of. one like error free. Yeah. Maybe error free isn't fair, right? But minimal with minimal error. It does yes. all of these things with, with minimal errors. With minimal right? errors. <laughs> excellent. I really like, and you and I are aware of a recent case for oh, which yeah. that really did. It, you said a job description has never saved a case, but I'm this one comes pretty close. Right. Whereas a court of appeals case and the job description required the person to provide excellent customer service. Right. And the person said it was an ADA essential job function. The person said, well, I can, with these accommodations, provide customer service. And the employer's point was, but it will not be at the same level that we expect. It will not and be that is excellent required client for this service. Job. And every client interaction has to be excellent. Yeah. Right? For this. I love that. And the court repeated that over and over and over. The word so excellent. it resonated with the court. It so resonated. those words can can make a difference, right? So yes. don't be afraid to use yes. adjectives like that where appropriate. Now I wouldn't say excellent in front of every single task, right? But <laughs> So. That might intimidate a few employees, yeah. right? And say, I can never actually do this. Yes. But um, yes, remember to include um, core values also because sometimes job descriptions are used for hiring, as we mentioned earlier. And that way you'll attract people, right, that understand these things are important to you and that hopefully are aligned, right, uh, themselves with those I things. I love that. So. Good. I do too. Okay, so key takeaways for our listeners today. Key what takeaways. do you think? Get more excited about revising job descriptions yes. <laughs> and writing out, them. Yes. You can add value to your organization Absolutely. by adopting some of the things we Absolutely. have discussed. Right? Absolutely. Think about exemptions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Think about those essential job functions, which you will not call essential job functions, on the job description. And think about the non-task oriented uh, essential functions that yes. you want to be listed. And through that, I, I can't emphasize enough. You're going to need buy-in and information from the direct supervisor. Yeah. So think about how to best get that and leverage that to update the job description itself. As I said, if it's going to be too much of a task to start from just to bring them all out and update them right now, do it as you're posting positions. Mm -hmm. You can do it as you're doing evaluations too. That's another great. That's another great a time natural to do it. time to yes. update a job. Love it. That's awesome. Okay, I hope everyone's looking forward to it. I know. What do you Excellent. think? Did we get them? I hope so. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. Bye, Sarah. Bye.